Catechesis is the whole process of formation we have in the church to help people to come into the church and to grow in the Christian life. So we're really leading people into the life of God, into the life of the church. And it matters because the whole point of this is to help people to get to heaven. So we're preparing people for eternal life. Welcome to the Art of Catechesis. This is an eight-part series uh, that's meant to serve catechist training and certification in the Archdiocese of Denver. My name is Dr. Jared Stout. I am the Director of Formation for the Archdiocese of Denver. I work uh, both in catechesis and evangelization as well as in Catholic schools. So we are here to just give an overview of what catechesis is. This is a bit of a crash course, if you will, uh, just to give you some fundamental points to understand catechesis and some training on how to be a more effective catechist. So before we get into the first session of our eight-part series, I just want to go over an overview of the entire series that we have. So uh, we can see our topics here in the eight sessions. Uh, we're going to start with this first one with what is catechesis. Uh, we're then going to look at, in two parts, the two major documents that guide our work in catechesis. First, the Bible and the divine pedagogy, which is how God is a teacher and teaches us how to teach. Uh, then we'll move into the catechism and how the catechism is the basis for our teaching of Catholic doctrine. We'll take a step back a little bit after that and look at the new evangelization. Uh, and that helps us to understand the context for doing catechesis today uh, in the midst of our secular culture in particular. Uh, we'll then look at the central role of the family. The family is one of the most important determinants for the effectiveness of our catechesis. Are the parents involved? Is the family living what we're teaching in catechesis? So we'll unpack that a bit more. We'll then get into catechetical methods, how we teach catechesis more effectively. Uh, and then we'll look at evangelization and discipleship as key aspects of how we teach catechesis, especially in light of the new evangelization. And then finally, we'll look at growing in prayer, just coming closer to God as catechists so that we can serve Him and the people we're working with uh, more faithfully. Okay, so those are our topics. Um, I want to make a note about books here as well. Uh, we have two key texts that guide all catechesis, and that's the Bible and the catechism. And so at the beginning of each series, we're actually going to be working with the Bible. So it'll be uh, important that you have a Bible handy. Um, and we'll be using the catechism especially for our third session. So it'd be good to have the catechism for at least that one, even though you might just want to have it ready for all of the sessions. Uh, we do have a book to go along with this series. So work with your parish on, on getting a copy of this book. It's called Fellow Workers and the Truth, a Handbook for Catechists. And so if you look at the table of contents, these themes follow the table of contents uh, with just one clarification. The first chapter, What is Catechesis, ends with the discussion of the Bible and the Catechism. So we're breaking out this first chapter into our first three sessions. But other than that, uh, the table of contents will follow our eight session topics. And so uh, it would be great if you read this text along with this training series. The other text I just want to point you to is something called the General Directory for Catechesis. Uh, this is the, the guiding document that the church has given us for understanding what catechesis is and how to teach it. So I just want to point out that this is a backdrop for my own approach to catechesis. It informs a lot of the points that I'm making today. So it's a good text also just to keep in mind and possibly to 
uh, reference at different points as you just grow in, in your own understanding and practice of catechesis. Okay, so our last point of intro here is looking at the structure of each lesson. And so we have four major parts. We're, go we're going to begin with a brief uh, Lexio Divina, which is a reflection, a prayerful reflection on a passage of Scripture. I'm then going to give an overview uh, with three overarching points to understand the lesson. Uh, then we're going to stop, and I'm going to have a series of discussion questions uh, for you to use in your own parish. If you're watching this individually, that's fine. Uh, you can just think through these points on your own. Uh, but it is better to be doing this class as a group so that both with the Lexio and with the discussion points, you can stop and just continue uh, things as a group at the parish. And then finally, we'll have one last point of just a more practical application based on the themes of the lesson. Okay, so that is what we're doing in the Art of Catechesis. And so we're going to begin now with our first Lexio. Lexio Divina just means a divine reading of Scripture. And so we're going to look at Acts 2. And we're going to start in the middle of the chapter at Acts 2, 14. And just to give a little background here, right? So Luke is the author of the Acts of the Apostles. It's a continuation of, of his gospel that begins with Jesus' ascension into heaven. And so this is the key moment when Jesus is telling his apostles that they have to continue his work and his mission, and he will be guiding them from the right hand of the Father. And he's going to give them an essential gift to accomplish this mission, and that is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's very life that Jesus breathes upon his apostles. And so what we see in Acts 1 is that Jesus ascends to the Father, and then the apostles choose a replacement for Judas. Then at the beginning of Acts 2, we have Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down upon the apostles gathered together with Mary, and then what happens? Immediately after the Holy Spirit comes down upon them, they go out to the assembled crowd who was gathered at the temple, and Peter begins preaching. So as soon as they receive the Holy Spirit, they begin catechizing, evangelizing and catechizing. And so we have the first example of catechesis on Pentecost Sunday. So we're going to read uh, Peter's sermon that he gave on Pentecost, and then we'll also just finish with the effects, the huge impact that this first catechetical address had on the crowd. So uh, I'm going to read it and give a reflection. We're not going to be doing this within the context of prayer, but we're going to pause the video after my reflection, and then I encourage you in prayer to read the text again. And if you're to, there with a group, to discuss uh, the passage in more detail. So I'll begin uh, reading Acts 2, 14 and following. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these men are not drunk, the apostles who are coming out and they're speaking and everyone's understanding them in their own language, right? They're not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which is nine o'clock in the morning. We can't be drunk, it's, it's morning time. Uh, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, yes, and on my men servants and my maid servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. This is what happened at Pentecost. The spirit came down upon the apostles, the spirit is poured out upon them, and they are speaking with the prophetic power of the spirit. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. 
and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and manifest day. And it shall be that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here Peter, still quoting the prophet Joel, is actually pointing back to the day of the Lord that happened with the crucifixion because the sky was darkened on that day. And there's even been some studies of what was happening in the sky that day, and there was a blood-red moon on the day of the crucifixion as well. So Peter is telling the crowd, okay, you know the signs that God gave with the day of the Lord that just came. Men of Israel, this is Peter his, in his own words now again, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. And that's the end of, of Peter's quote with David. He's referring to David to point to the resurrection. So he, he talked about the outpouring of the Spirit and the crucifixion from Joel, and now the resurrection through the Psalms. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patri patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants upon this throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you see and hear. Right? This is the fulfillment of Jesus ascending and pouring out the Spirit on us. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, so he's quoting David again, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a stool for your feet. Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Right, so he's connecting the crowd into what happened with the crucifixion and resurrection, making that personal connection. So what was the impact of this sermon? Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Right, so it moved them. They want to know what should our response be? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You shall experience what we are experiencing. So they're witnessing to this gift. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, with everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other words, exhorting them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and prayers. Okay, so I just want to unpack this passage a little bit more because this is crucial. This is the first moment of catechesis, as I mentioned, and we get a glimpse of the whole entire process of catechesis from what we see in Peter. First of all, the fact that this is Pentecost Sunday is crucial. What we're seeing is that all catechesis flows from the Holy Spirit. Catechesis is about accepting the Word of God in our hearts, and it's the Holy Spirit who makes that possible on both ends. 
The Holy Spirit guides the proclamation and the teaching, just as we see in Peter, but the Holy Spirit also guides the acceptance of the message as we see in the crowd. So the Holy Spirit is the key to all catechesis. Secondly, we see in Peter the core message of catechesis, and we call this core message the kerygma. We'll come back to this a couple of times uh, throughout the art of catechesis. The kerygma is the message that God has become man in Jesus Christ, and Jesus has died for our sins, and he rose again from the dead to give us new life. So it's the proclamation of that core message. This is what matters more than anything else in catechesis, is giving the key to salvation in the kerygma. The next thing we see in the passage is conversion. So Peter says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So it's not just our generation that's corrupt, right? This is constantly a turning from the world to God and accepting what God wants to offer. So when we accept the kerygma, when we accept the message of catechesis, there's a conversion and we begin to follow God and not the ways of the world any longer. So a turning, a changing of mind, a changing of heart. And so when the crowd converts, they're, they're cut to the heart. And they say, well, Peter, what do we do? And he says, be baptized, every one of you. And so we see that catechesis is ordered to the sacraments. Not just initially, right? We do have the sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation in the Eucharist. But catechesis helps us to continue to receive the sacraments well. And so when we're catechizing effectively, we're helping people to come closer to God through the sacraments. And then when people receive the sacraments, then we also have to live according to the message of catechesis and the teaching of the church, according to the word of God. And so it says at the very end that they were faithful, they held steadfastly to the apostles' teaching, so that's the doctrine of the church and the moral teaching of the church, and to fellowship, to the community centered around the apostles and the sacraments, to the breaking of the bread, that's the Eucharist, and to prayer. And so we see that this core aspect of what we actually teach in catechesis and what we want people to live in catechesis at the end of this passage. It's the, the teaching of the apostles, the fellowship in the community, the breaking of the bread and all of the sacraments, and coming close to God in prayer. So it's really amazing that in this short passage, we see the whole picture of catechesis. So what I'd like you to do is we're going to pause the video here, uh, and, uh, and I'd like you to read this passage again and pray over it and, and see what insights that God gives you through a, a, a prayerful reading of this text. And then if you're in a group, I'd like you then to discuss what really stood out to you uh, with one another. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at what exactly catechesis is. Some people call it religious education, but catechesis is a more precise word. And catechesis comes from the Greek katecheo, which literally means to echo. And so why, why would that be the name for our teaching of the faith? Uh, there's a couple of reasons, and I think that the most fundamental reason is that God has revealed his word to us, and we receive that word in our lives, and we pass it on. We pass it down through the generations faithfully. Jesus formed his apostles, and the apostles have formed, formed others, especially bishops, and we have this unbroken line throughout the centuries of handing down the word from generation to generation. In catechesis, we're part of that. We're part of this chain of passing the word down, of echoing the word. There's another reason as well, and it, and it looks back to the ancient pedagogy. Pedagogy is just a way of teaching. And so people would give the teaching of the church 
and it would be memorized and then repeated back. So that was another way in which the teaching of the church was echoed. The catechist presents the teaching, it's echoed back in the one who is learning it. So that's literally what the word catechesis means. But it's also different from any other kind of teaching because catechesis is not just about content. It does involve content essentially, but it's also more than that. So if we look at our first point here, just trying to define what catechesis is, I would say more than teaching, it's a formation in the Christian way of life. And that involves teaching content because we want to come to know who God is through his revelation, but it involves more than that because we want to help people to come into contact with the living God. We want him to know, we want them to know God in a personal way and to live differently because of that, to live out the faith in their lives. And so we have to really approach catechesis from our second point here, a supernatural point of view. If you're just teaching a regular subject matter, you can test about whether or not you've been an effective teacher by giving a test at the end. Okay, can you repeat back to me what I taught you? Okay, that's good. And we can even do that in catechesis, sort of test people's uh, level of knowledge. But it's harder to really look at the deeper impact because if catechesis brings people into a contact with God, that's something that is inside. And you may not even see the fruits of it. It's a supernatural work because if we're teaching a practical skill, like even carpentry, right? You can look at the finished product and say, wow, that's a beautiful table. I guess we succeeded, you know, in teaching about carpentry. But a supernatural work means that we're bringing people into contact with God who is beyond the world. And so we can't just point to the finished product other than a joyful Christian life that's being lived out uh, by people within the community, right? That's the goal. But it's a goal that, as we said in our Lexio, comes from the Holy Spirit. And a catechist is a mediator or a bridge trying to bring people into this contact with the living God. But God does the work secretly in the heart in a hidden way. Okay, so what is the goal of catechesis? Well, we've already mentioned it in that it's bringing people closer to God. We want people to meet God, to fall in love with Him, and to have a strong relationship with Him. But if we look at the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is actually heaven, right? This relationship with God that we're bringing people, you know, into, that we're trying to bring people into, right? It has its goal in an eternal relationship of love, an eternal friendship. And so really, this is one of the most important things that we can do. I'm just going to jump down here a little bit to why it matters, right? It matters because it is an issue of life and death, eternal life and death, right? Bringing people into union with God and everlasting love of God so that they can be happy with Him forever, right? We want to help people who are catechized. I'm going to refer to children or kids a lot, but if, if you're working with adults, that's fine. I just substitute adults, you know, in for my use of kids. So uh, we want the kids we're working with to be happy in this life, to really have what matters most in this life, but we want that to blossom into eternal happiness, happiness that will last forever. Because this life is something that is passing. It is temporary. And so unlike other forms of education where we're teaching to help people to be successful and to be a well-rounded and, and really a good person in this life, we're trying to do something that's even more important than that by bringing people into this eternal relationship that lasts forever. So how do we go about doing this? Well, really the whole series is going to try to unpack this. Catechesis is an art in the sense that it's not an exact science. 
We can't simply say, well, if you do this and then you do that, you will get the finished product. But what we're trying to do is dispose ourselves to be effective catechists and to create the right conditions for people to meet God. So it's an art form, and it requires knowing the content, uh, it requires a lot of prayer, and it requires relationships, and it requires helping people to live out what we're teaching them. So these are all the aspects of the art, and we're going to unpack all those various aspects. So what are our major sources? Well, we've referred to them a little bit already. The Bible and the Catechism are the two major sources, and we're going to have lessons on both of them, uh, just to explain their importance for catechesis. And so we want to have constant reference to these sources. And we're going to model that a bit with our Lexio at the beginning of each of our lessons. We need to be deeply rooted in Scripture. We need to be deeply rooted in the teaching of the church. And if, and if you're at this point saying, oh, I don't know if I can be a catechist because I'm not an expert in the Bible. I'm not an expert in the catechism. That's okay. Because we're going to just continue through the years to just learn more and more, step by step. You don't have to be an expert and really, it's good to be approaching this from the angle that we are learning with those we are catechizing. We're entering into the realities of the faith together, and we're discussing things together. We're praying through things together. And over time, you will learn more. I mean, no one begins as an expert. 20 years from now, maybe you can say, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Maybe I am an expert now, and you can mentor other people. But this is the beginning. Right, is just be, is laying out a vision for what catechesis is and growing in our knowledge and our practice of catechesis over time. And so our last point here, the scope of the Christian life, right? Catechesis covers all of life. We want to help people to be followers of Jesus in every dimension. So that includes knowledge. It includes living a life of virtue and holiness. It includes growing deeper in prayer. And it includes serving others. Right? If you're a follower of Jesus, then it means you live like Jesus and you enter into his mission. And so we follow Jesus at school. We follow Jesus at work. We follow Jesus at home. And so catechesis truly is something comprehensive. We want to have our lives transformed and to be a witness and a model to others so that their lives can be transformed by Jesus in the Holy Spirit. And so that is the scope of catechesis, the entire Christian life. I just want to give a brief overview of the history of catechesis. We're not going to go into too much detail here, but I think it's important to understand how catechesis has developed throughout the last 2,000 years and where we stand right now with catechesis. We've already had a little glimpse of how the apostles did catechesis. Uh, catechesis really began when the apostles went around throughout the ancient world, the Roman Empire and also to the Persian Empire and beyond, and Originally, they would go to synagogues, and they would show how Jesus fulfilled all the promises of the Old Testament. That was the beginning of catechesis. And we're even going to look at um, the story of the journey to Emmaus, where, where Jesus unpacks the Old Testament himself. So Jesus showed the, his own followers how to do catechesis by looking back at the Old Testament and showing how all the prophecies were fulfilled from the Old Testament. So that was the beginning um, of going to the synagogues and appealing to the God-fearers. And then the apostles ordained bishops to continue their own ministry. This was the beginning of apostolic succession. And so in the early church, the bishops were the primary catechists. They would gather people together, and they would do catechesis themselves or they would delegate a priest to do this. And this is the beginning of what we call the baptismal catechumenate. 
The way that people were first interested in learning about the faith is that they saw the witness and the role model from Christians in the ancient world. They said, wait a second, they're living very differently than anyone else. They respect human life. They have a loving marriage of equal partners in the marriage. That was a huge difference in the ancient world. They're living a happy, joyful life. And so people would come and they would start asking questions to the early Christians. And so catechesis would actually begin in the home with Christians witnessing. And then when they saw evidence that people were really interested in accepting the gospel and wanting to learn more, they would bring them to the bishop or to his priest delegate. And they would begin this process of what's called the catechumenate. And this would last usually at least a couple of years where people would go through this instruction in the faith. And then they would be brought for an examination. Uh, we now call this the rite of election. And they would be elected to be initiated into the church. And the beginnings of Lent actually come from what followed the election. An intense period of time, 40 days, of fasting and praying to get ready for Easter. And so initiation would happen at Easter, and then there would be a period of mystagogy following, because in the early church, uh, there was something called the Disciplina Arcana, where uh, the Christians would not talk about the details of the sacraments until after initiation. And even catechumens would be dismissed um, after the sermon. And so uh, mystagogy was really going deep into an understanding of the sacraments following initiation. So that's how the early church did catechesis, and we're going to come back to the catechumenate as a model for our catechesis today. So we're going to look at that in more detail. Um, but what happened with the conversion of Constantine, a lot of people like to look back to Constantine and say how everything changed at that moment. That's usually overstated, but when it comes to the catechumenate, there was a big change in the sense that when Christianity was legalized and then the Roman Empire became Christian under the Emperor Theodosius, was not Constantine, but later on, all of a sudden, a lot of people wanted to become Christian because they were wanted to marry a Christian or because they wanted to become Christian to get a job in the government. And so the early church became flooded and eventually the catechumenate broke down because initiation was occurring mostly for children in the early Middle Ages. And so that's a big shift that we see. Uh, The baptism of adults happened with the conversion of the barbarians in Western Europe from either paganism or the heresy Arianism. And so the structure of the catechism as we know it, looking at the creed, looking at the seven sacraments, the Ten Commandments, And the Our Father actually dates back to the early Middle Ages when large groups of people who are becoming Catholic from the barbarian tribes were given basic catechesis on those four pillars. The Creed, the Seven Sacraments, the Ten Commandments, and the Our Father. Those were the basic things that the church determined people needed to know. When we look at the high Middle Ages, uh, there were a number of synods of bishops that said, that every Sunday people needed to receive catechesis from priests. So that was the beginning of what we refer to as Sunday school. And so there was regular instruction on Sundays throughout the Middle Ages. And a lot of catechesis also happened through art. When you look at the beautiful churches and the paintings and the sculptures, um, and also even illuminated Bibles, there was something called the Bible of the Poor, which was just large illuminations of scriptural uh, scenes. This was the way that the church taught. So through the the Sunday school, through art, um, and also just through the fabric of Christian life that existed in the Middle Ages, that the faith infused everything that people did. And that itself was a form of catechesis, which, of course, we no longer have um, in our secular culture today. A big turning point in catechesis happened with the Protestant Reformation about 500 years ago. Uh, all of a sudden now the faith was contested. And so there was more explicit teaching and apologetics about the faith. And this was the beginning of catechisms as we know it. And at that point, catechisms were actually written in a question and answer format. And so the most famous was the Roman catechism, 
uh, which came out of the Council of Trent. And it was a series of question and answers about the faith with that structure, which I already mentioned, the creed, the sacraments, uh, the Ten Commandments, and the Our Father. That was the structure of these catechisms. And so this is also the time of a missionary expansion throughout the church. Following the Reformation, there were large numbers of missionaries who went throughout the world to Latin America, to Africa, to um, Southeast Asia, and spread the faith. And so we also have catechesis going throughout the world, preparing converts for the sacraments. Um, in the United States, when we think about catechesis um, in the last 100, 150 years, a lot of times we think about the Baltimore Catechism. And that was the local catechism here. And so catechesis in this time period of the last few hundred years until the 1960s was based on memorization of the faith. And so Catholics in, in the modern period generally had a good grasp of doctrine. Um, but catechesis was not always very biblical. Um, it was not always focused on teaching how to live the Christian faith. I think a lot of times that was taken for granted. And so catechesis focused on helping kids to memorize different points of doctrine. That changed um, in the United States and throughout the world with Vatican II. Um, Vatican II recognized that we actually needed to resurrect the baptismal catechumenate from the early church. Why? Because now, just like in the early church, we're facing a pagan world again. And so we need to become missionaries again and great witnesses of the faith again. And, and catechesis, I would say, took a turn away from doctrine because it may have been overemphasized before Vatican II. And so people, not because of Vatican II, but just because of the turmoils following the Second Vatican Council, kind of threw out the catechism and said, well, we don't need that anymore. Cate catechesis is all about experience. And so catechesis went through a few decades of crisis where it became divorced from the truth of the faith. So Pope John Paul II, working with Cardinal Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict XVI, um, they actually introduced a new catechism that came out in 1992. And I think we've seen a great flourishing of catechesis uh, from that point in a, in a time of renewal. And I think now, if we look at our, our, the current state of catechesis today, we're in a much more dynamic place than we've been in, for catechesis in a long time. We have the baptismal catechumenate alive again through RCIA. We have much more of a focus on evangelization and discipleship. There's much more of an emphasis on the study of the Bible um, and even the lectionary tying that into catechesis. Um, and I think that we, and through the catechism, right, we, we have a stronger emphasis on doctrine. So we have a more complete understanding of catechesis. We don't have an imbalance in uh, one direction or another. So that's my brief history of catechesis and, and where we stand currently. Now I want to look at this from a more personal point of view. Uh, you're watching uh, this video because you have accepted the call to be a catechist in at least some uh, shape or form, right? There's different ways of being a catechist. You may be a director of religious education. You may be volunteering for Sunday school. You may be involved in youth ministry. You may be doing RCIA or even involved in marriage prep. So there's different ways of engaging in catechesis, um, also in, in Catholic schools as well. Uh, but you've accepted this um, in some way. And so first of all, I want to thank you for your generosity and responding to that call. Now, you don't have to be doing this. And so it's, it's really wonderful that you've heard this call. God may have called you through a friend, family member, through the pastor, through a worker at the parish. But somebody issued that invitation to you and you said yes. But there's a deeper invitation going on here. And so even if someone else made that invitation, even if they, you know, put some pressure on you, like, we really need some help. Uh, nonetheless, ultimately, this was God calling you to do two things. One, to grow in your relationship with him. And so that's the most important thing for being a catechist, is strengthening your own relationship with God, your life of prayer, and learning about your own faith. 
Uh, and secondly, he has called you to share in the work which he established, right? He, throughout the Old Testament, God taught us through the prophets. And in the New Testament, God himself became man, and he became a catechist. That is, he was himself sharing the teaching of the kingdom of God. And then he established the church to continue on this mission. And so now he's calling you to be a fellow worker with him, to share in Jesus' own ministry in union with other catechists in your own parish. So it's a beautiful work of cooperating with God. Everyone is called to serve the church in some way. Every single Christian, if you are baptized, by virtue of your baptism, you have a vocation to share and to spread the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean that every single person is called to be a catechist, but every Christian is called to share and spread the kingdom of God. So it is important to discern how it is that God is calling you, how it is that God wants you to grow in your relationship with him, and how it is he wants you to share his kingdom. And so catechesis is one important way to do this. Uh, I want to look um, at the book uh, because we have a list here beginning at the bottom of page 11 of just some basic things as we're discerning the vocation or the calling to be a catechist that we should keep in mind. So first of all, a catechist is fully initiated. This is the, the, the bottom bullet point there in bold. So to be a catechist, you should be baptized, have received confirmation in your first communion. Uh, you should be, and this is now on page 12, be practicing your faith. Uh, sometimes, you know, being a catechist can inspire us to practice our faith uh, more fully, and, and that is a good thing. But we need to be a witness for living the Christian life to those we're working with, so we have to be uh, following especially the five uh, precepts of the church. So what are they? Um, attending Mass faithfully on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, receiving the Eucharist as the second, and then the Sacrament of Confession, the third at least once a year. Uh, the fourth is observing fast days and abstinence, and finally supporting the mission of the church uh, materially, financially, and so uh, tithing to support the church. Uh, the next point is orthodox in belief. The word orthodoxy means that you uh, follow the church's teaching faithfully, that you adhere to the faith of the church, because catechesis transmits that faith. Uh, Cardinal Newman once said that a thousand questions do not equal one doubt. And so we're all learning about our faith. We're trying to understand our faith more, and so it's it's okay to have questions that you want to understand more and, and to look into more, and you may have questions you want to ask somebody at your parish to grow in your faith more. Uh, but to be a catechist, you're not teaching your own opinions, right? And so it's, you don't want to be saying, well, I don't really agree with the church on this point, right? That would be a problem for being a catechist. You should be active in your parish life by right? receiving um, the sacraments and dedicated to service, and of course, being a catechist as part of uh, being active in your parish. So those are the basic points, but then there's also some dispositions which are important to be an effective catechist. First, to have a vibrant faith. Uh, to be good at working with people, right? Because you're, you're relating to people that you're teaching. Uh, to have an appropriate temperament, that is, you know, you're not kind of pushing people away, you're being a, a good witness that you have a desire for prayer and to grow in prayer. Um, and it can help to have some um, experience in teaching and ministry, but everybody has to begin somewhere. And so if you're new, that's, that's completely fine. You just want to be uh, getting help from other people and, and getting more experience. Okay, but what's the most important thing? Is as I've mentioned before, we're not looking for experts to come in to say, I already have all of this experience. I already know the faith but we're looking for a disposition to learn and to grow. So being a catechist is, is an opportunity to really to get closer to God um, and to learn how to do catechesis. Um, and as I've already mentioned too, this is 
approaching the realities of the faith with, the, with kids or whoever we're catechizing, that we're approaching this together. No one is a complete expert on the teachings of the faith except God, right? God is the only one who knows himself perfectly. And we are all in the process of learning. Everyone, even including our priests and bishops, uh, are always trying to grow deeper in faith. And so this life is a pilgrimage of growing closer to God and learning more. So don't ever be discouraged that you're not an expert. What we really want to do through this disposition of openness is to allow God to work in and through us. That's what he wants to do. God is the one who ultimately is the teacher. He's the one who is the catechist, who works directly in people's hearts. And we want to provide an opportunity through prayer and through our teaching and through our witness and our activities with the kids for God to be present and for God to act. That is what we want in our catechesis. Okay, so we're actually uh, now going to pause again and we're going to have a discussion. So if you're watching this yourself, that's fine. Just think through these points, but hopefully there's somebody um, at the parish that you can discuss these points with. How did God call you into the work of catechesis? And why do you think he did that? How do you feel about teaching catechesis? Right? What are you excited about? Uh, what are you maybe nervous about? Um, what's your experience been like if you've been doing this so far? Um, how would you like to grow in your own relationship with God as a catechist? How will you continue uh, to learn the faith? and particularly to learn more about the Bible and the catechism. Uh, do you have any experience teaching, whether it's in catechesis or in another context? And if so, how is catechesis both similar to and different from some of the other teaching experiences that you've had? Right? Because it's a different kind of thing as a spiritual work. And what would you like to see? What, would your, what are your goals um, for those you are catechizing? What are kind of your hopes um, for entering into this work? So we're going to pause here and just give you an opportunity to work through these points. Following our discussions, uh, in each session, we're just going to end with one more practically uh, oriented point. In this case, so we're just going to finish this first session on what catechesis is uh, by looking at what effective catechesis looks like. And the first point is that catechesis teaches God's message faithfully and fully. That is, you know, we, we obviously are not teaching the entire faith at one point, but in the course of the education that we're providing and the formation that we're providing, that our children will get the, the fullness of the faith. It's not up to us to pick and choose to say, well, I don't really care about this part of the church's teaching or I don't agree with that. But our job is to be this conduit of taking what God has given us through his revelation in and through the church and to present that to those we're working with. So we provide that faithful representation of what God teaches us in and through the church. Um, the second way to be an effective catechist is to approach your ministry with prayer. That is, we teach about the faith, but then we're always praying through what we're teaching with the kids. Why? Because prayer makes present what we're teaching about. So when we pray, we may be talking about the Trinity, but we open our hearts to the Trinity in prayer. And so teaching is always something, when we're doing catechesis, that wants to bring those we're catechizing into contact with the realities we're teaching about, the truths we're teaching about. So we need to be approaching catechesis through prayer individually. That is, we're praying before the lesson to prepare our hearts and to ask God to be present. And then we're also praying as a group during the catechetical session because this allows God to be there, to be present, 
and to direct things himself. We want God to be in charge and in control and to be open to what he wants to do in and through us. Uh, the third point is we need to be engaging, right? If, if we're very boring, <laughs> then the kids will just be like, oh, who cares? Okay, this one hour, when is it over, right? And so we, we don't want to make it simply engaging without content, but we want to make the content relatable to the students' lives. So it's faithful, it's prayer-filled, prayer -filled, and it's engaging. And so we should have discussions with them to discuss why we think that this material is relevant, why we think it's important, and how it relates to what they're going through in their lives. So we want back and forth. We want dialogue. We want conversation. This is an important point. We want to use stories. That's, how, that's part of the divine pedagogy. God uses stories in the Bible. And so we should use stories. We should use stories about our own lives. We should use stories from the lives of the saints. And so we can be looking up uh, some of these stories. Uh, we should be um, also using the stories from the Bible directly. Uh, we should be using art. Beauty is very important for catechesis. And so beautiful music, beautiful images, um, as just a way to draw people in and to, and to represent in visible form what we're teaching about. And we should be doing activities. And I think we have to make sure that the activities are things that actually help the kids to meet God. Right? If it's just something that kills time, we say, well, we don't have enough time for that. Usually we have very limited time with the kids who come to us for catechesis. And so activities should be something meaningful. They can be discussions or reflections or ways of just making things you know, come down to the level of the kids. But make sure that it's content-oriented and meaningful. And then we need to provide witness that we are a role model, we're providing a form of mentorship to the people we're working with through catechesis. So we give them an example, we show them how to grow in prayer and how to learn about the faith. Like I said, we're not experts. And so we come before the things that we're teaching about as disciples, when we, we sit at the feet of Jesus together. And so we model that, we model discipleship to the kids to say that we're all learning, we're all on the way together. And we work through with them how to follow God in the world. And so we want to make this concrete, right? We give the teaching, we pray, we make it interesting, and then we help translate it and, and give a model for what this looks like in a way that's lived out um, in daily life. Okay, so this is the conclusion then of our first session on what catechesis is. You can continue the conversation uh, with your group um, in the parish, uh, but we'll end our first session with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.